we were going to start with stop it. Number six, stop looking for perfection. And everything changed at about six o'clock this morning. I was up having my devotions, and I felt the Lord say to me, take your preach from this week and do it next week. I said, okay, what are we going to do this week? He says, I'll tell you. So I go have a shower, eat breakfast, have a quiet time, then go and sit down, and the Lord says nothing till about seven o'clock. And this clock, she's ticking, and I want to leave to be here to even try and get to the early morning prayer meeting. I'm looking, thinking, oh, Lord, and then he starts to speak. And I thought, oh, you know those prophetic moments where God changes everything? So I just had one of those this morning. So I, got, I had probably 15 minutes to prepare what I'm going to say now. Came out of two scriptures God grabbed me with. Then you, you, The whole time you're thinking, am I right? Am I wrong? Have I heard right? Haven't I heard? Someone comes to me during worship now and said, grabs me and says, just, I, I, I didn't know you, who was preaching this morning, but I felt God said, I must go to the preacher and say, just honor the Holy Spirit. Well, that's a confirmation. Then another little girl comes to me now and says, I just I got a word for you. The Lord said, I just saw the Lord Jesus walk into the building, walk through the rows, come straight to you, put coal in your mouth and say, you must speak that word of purity. How's that? Just like that. So here we are. you ready? Good. So uh, I was quite intrigued. I brought my big Bible this morning. I mean business. Anyone not listening is getting this four and a half kilogram Bible thrown at you. So I'm reading through the book of John, and I get near the end of chapter two. It's a wonderful story about the wedding at Cana. You know the story, hey? The, the nice wine after the first wine, and the point Jesus was making is that his ministry, which comes after, is going to be far better than anything that came before. So that's the context. And then towards the end, the last three verses intrigued me. Verse 23 says, now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs that he was doing. But Jesus, on his part, did not entrust himself to them because he knew all people. Another translation says he knows the hearts of people. And he needed no one to bear witness about man, for he himself knew what was in man. Now, I'm going to talk about this morning what's in us. And how to see it changed. What's in us? Newton, that clever man of science, said, one of his many very clever things, is that for every action, there's a reaction. If you don't believe me, look to the person next to you and punch them in the face round about now. <laughs> Something's going to happen. Again, depending on the size of the person next to you, it's either going to be a cry, looking at some of you, is going to pull out a knife, we do live in the veil. Others are going to punch you back. And a few very pious people will then turn the other cheek and say, now this one, please. But there's going to be very few of you, mainly the cowards. Now, when someone does something, others react. Jesus is looking to this crowd and he's saying, I'm seeing stuff that you're not seeing. And the problem with us and the Lord is that he sees from heaven, we see from earth. And although we are told that we need to renew our minds constantly, there is still this level or this place within us where our thoughts are not the same as the Lord's, but we are often drawing conclusions on His behalf. We are often saying, this is what the Lord says. We are often spraining our arms, our shoulders especially, patting ourselves on the back for how wonderful we are because we're not listening. Book of Revelation. Jesus goes to the church and says, I'm knocking on the door of your heart trying to get in. Not to the world to the church. And we have churches full today, led by people who are telling the church, you are brilliant. You're doing great. Jesus looks at his disciples at the end of John chapter 2, and at that point of his ministry, he says, I cannot entrust myself to you, because I know what's in your heart. It's, it's quite serious. Hey? Now, Michael, you look this morning and say, well, surely we're under the new covenant. I mean, aren't we better now? Well, I would like to think so. But let's just see where this sermon goes this morning. You see, we can't look into our own hearts. It's difficult. But are we courageous enough to allow the Lord 
to speak to us. You see, when God looks at the heart, he says the heart is, is uh, in fact, Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things, and it is beyond cure. Now, I'm not talking about that thing that pumps. That's also sometimes beyond cure. That's why you need pipes and doctors and stuff. But with the heart, the nature, the personality, the innermost being of a person, where you say, where did that come from? Where did, even as a Christian, is it not true things will happen? You'll say, where did that come from? I thought I was over that. I, I thought that I'm not like that anymore. We need to see the heart as God sees it, then see how we fix it. God knows what's in a man. Right in the beginning, the problem started. God puts a man and a woman in the tree, puts a whole lot of, uh, in the tree, in a garden. <laughs> All the evolutionists for a minute just said, yes. <laughs> so God takes a man and a woman, and first, let's say this, let's, let's, let's start with the boys. God takes a man, puts him in a garden, puts a whole lot of trees around him. How many? We don't know. And he says, look, east, north, south, west. Look around you. Eat everything except that one. Then God takes a woman from the man. And he's supposed to tell her. Then the Bible is very clear that the woman was deceived, not the man. Is that true? All the men? Amen. amen. Who was deceived? Okay, girls. I'll say it again. Who was deceived? <laughs> Who wasn't deceived? Who wasn't deceived? Deceived means being tricked. The woman was deceived. The man wasn't. He made a clear decision. And his decision was this. I don't care how many trees in a garden you give me to eat. If there's one thing that's going to stand where I have to make a choice to be dependent on you and obey you rather than me, stuff it. Flip and take your tree. And Jesus, God said to him, you eat from that tree, you'll die. You'll die naturally, you'll die spiritually. The moment you choose to disobey my commands, you start a process. What did the man say? I don't care how many trees if I look north, east, south, and west. You've given me liberty, but there's one area you haven't given me liberty in. I can't stand an area where I don't have free liberty over my choices. I'm a man, and I decide where I spend my money. I'm a man. I decide when and where I go. I'm a man, and I have a brain, and no one tells me the end thereof was death. Then we go a little bit further. God gives him a gap. And I'm going to read from it now in Isaiah. God says, all right, what you'll do is we'll rescue mankind. And he does it through a picture form in the wilderness by taking Israel out of Egypt through the wilderness, and he's going to take them into a promised land. God takes Moses up a mountain and starts to give him the law of the Lord. Remember, what is that law of the Lord? Yeah, hello, are you with me? Exodus 20, Ten Commandments. You shall have no other God before me. You shall not make any image in my likeness. While he's giving that law, they're doing exactly that. They take their jewelry, they throw it into a fire, Aaron says. And out pops a golf. It's amazing. It's miraculous. It must be real. Because the heart of man... And these people had seen the miracles God had done. These are not people who couldn't say, we don't know. They had seen signs and wonders. And if some of them had been locked up in Goshen so that they literally couldn't see some of the things being done, I mean, the hail and the flies and the grasshoppers and the gnats they could see. Maybe they didn't see the, the water turn to blood. Maybe they didn't see the firstborn die. Maybe there were things they didn't see. But every last one of them walked to an impenetrable sea and saw it open. Every single one of them. Not only that, every single one of them walked right through it. Then they go on the other side. And what do they start saying? We're missing the cows and the bulls where we came from. Make us a God, Aaron. Aaron comes up, these are your gods. It's the heart of man. Then Jesus comes, perfect, in his humanity and his divinity, perfect. And when they go to, to judge him, to crucify him, he says, what sin have I committed? They had no answer. He was righteous. Doesn't matter, on the tree. Why? Because we will not bow the knee. 
Then in Isaiah, let me just go there. Because I'm already eight minutes into this. In Isaiah, I was reading. And the Lord says, in verse 8 of chapter 63, For he, God said, surely they're my people, children who won't deal falsely. And he became their savior. In all their affliction, he was afflicted. And the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity, he redeemed them. He lifted them up and he carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be the enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people, where he brought them out of the sea and all the rest of it. Where, and then the questions asked, where is he who put them in the midst? Uh, where is he who puts in the midst of them his Holy Spirit? Where is he? And then Isaiah cries out, look down from heaven and see from your holy and beautiful habitation. Where are your zeal and your might, the stirring of your inner parts and your compassion? They're held back from me. But you're our father. In verse 16, you, our Lord, are our father. Our redeemer from old is your name. So Isaiah is looking at the brokenness of Israel, but he's calling upon the goodness of God. And he says, Lord, where's your spirit that you've taken from us? Lord, do me a favor, as I was praying on behalf of the people. Can you look at your own goodness and find something in yourself to come down to us again? Because you're our Father. And He also understands that without the influence and the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we're all going to drift off. You can be in this room today the most committed Christian you like. And I'm telling you, if the Holy Spirit doesn't hold you and keep you, your own nature will take you right back again. Isaiah says, O Lord, why do you make us wander from your ways and harden our hearts so that we don't fear you? Return for the sake of your servant. And Isaiah says in chapter 64 verse 1, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would quake at your presence. And then verse 4, which ignited me that I actually put on Instagram this morning. From of old, no one has heard or perceived by the ear. No eye has seen a God besides you who acts for those who wait for him. There is no God besides our God who will act for those who learn how to wait for Him. You, God, meet Him who joyfully works righteousness. Those who remember you, Lord, in your ways. Behold, you are angry and we sinned. In our sins, we've been a long time. How will we be saved? Verse 7, Isaiah says, there's no one who calls on your name. There's no one who rouses himself to take a hold of you. God's done so much in this church over the last weeks, months, changing things in people's hearts. The sermons have been very pointed, very directed. Evening meetings, we've been talking. I'll be continuing tonight about what it means to walk in the Holy Spirit. But I want to ask the question that I believe God is asking us as a church. Who are they who are rousing themselves to lay a hold of the Lord? So a guy in church, I think he's coming to 10 o'clock meeting, gets hold of me last night, gives me this whole spiel. You know when Oaks leave a quick voice note that's like four minutes long? Then another one that's two minutes, another one that's a minute. And this is just a guy last night who was looking out the window and met the Lord, fell on his face. Guy in our church, God completely undid him over a whole period of time last night. Who will rouse themselves? To take hold of the Lord. And Isaiah says again in verse 8, But Lord, you're our Father. Be not so terribly angry, O Lord. I mean Isaiah 64. Remember not iniquity forever. Behold, please look. We are your people. See, Isaiah is calling out to God and he's saying, Lord, there's things going on in our hearts as a people. If you don't act, we're in trouble. But what can we do? We can ask you to act. We can ask you to rend the heavens. We can ask you to draw near to us. Because our faith, our Christianity, our boast is that we have a God who sees, hears, talks, relates to, walks with us. But then our practice is often different to the things we say we believe. Isn't it? Almost like we don't believe he's there. So go with me to Psalm 107 and we're going to land it looking at this. Psalm 107.
this is my Bible that I don't want to put marks in because every word of the Lord is important. So I don't want to ever be distracted by marks. And then this morning I wrecked all of it by making notes in my Bible. Turn with me to Psalm 107, please. Remember what I said? Adam in the garden said to this, this I'm going to go my own way even if it kills me. Because God had said, if you do that, you're going to die. He says, even if it kills me, I cannot, I will not bow the knee. Now, you and I in this room say, oh, I'm a Christian. This doesn't apply to me. I don't know why I came here this morning. Are you trying to tell me under God there are areas in your life, there are no areas in your life where you're refusing to bow the knee? Are you telling me there are no areas of life in your life where you have such compromise that you're refusing to bow the knee to the Lord? Are you saying, every part, ask everyone around me, in every area of my life, I'm completely submitted. There are no sins of the flesh that beset me. There is no evil in my heart towards other people. There is no judgmentalism. I haven't thought a bad thought about anyone in years. Move away from other people now because the lightning's coming through this building <laughs> in about a minute. Is there, is there none here who have looked and thought that person ought to be different? I can't come to church because there are so many hypocrites being yet another one. I suggest you maybe listen. Psalm 107 verse 1. Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. The corollary of that is, I'm not good. Is that right? Now, when I do preach on my thing that's called um, perfect, stop looking to things and people that are perfect. There are no perfect people. We know that. We get disappointed when we trust imperfect people. But what we want is we want and we expect others to be perfect, especially our spouses, to be perfect, but even if we don't have to be. And we do the same to God. We're saying, God, I want you to be good over my life, regardless of how I then conduct myself. And what I'll do is I'll tithe and I'll come to church occasionally. But like Adam, I'm going to give you every tree in the garden except one. Which one am I not going to give you, Lord? The one you said I can't touch. And we all have that one tree in the garden. We're not supposed to be touching. And we touch it every day. I will give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. His steadfast love endures forever. I want to say that again. His steadfast love endures forever. See, as we look at where we're going to go now, if the steadfast love of God did not endure, you and I couldn't sit here righteous before God. If his steadfast love did not endure. Now, you need to remember that when you look at your neighbor. You need to remember that when you pass judgment on the next person. It is the steadfast love of the Lord that endures. Okay, I'll give thanks to the Lord for his good. His steadfast love endures forever. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so. Say what? That the Lord is good. That his steadfast love endures forever. Say so. He, whom he has redeemed from trouble. That's what verse 1 says. And verse 2, is it up behind me or not? Okay, we'll get there. Psalm 107, verses 1 and 2. Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, verse 2 says, whom he has redeemed from trouble. Now I want to look quickly in Psalm 107, four areas of trouble from which people need to be redeemed. Verse 4 says, some have wandered in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry and thirsty, their soul fainted within them. I suggest it's those who have not found a spiritual home. Those who have not found a home in which they can truly live as family. You know, you cannot have found a spiritual home and be in church. How do you know? Because you pop in and you pop out. It's like you go to Woolies when you need food. You don't stay all week. Isn't it? Don't you walk in? Those who go to Woolies, pick and pay, Ackermans, wherever you go. Spaza, don't you walk in, get what you need and leave? 
doesn't mean you belong. Even if they give you a loyalty card, it doesn't mean anything. It's the same with some of us who go to church. I go, I get what I need, and I leave. The ogre that tell mustn't tell me, have a good day, and how are you, and shake my hand like you do here when you walk in. Yeah, I mean, I don't want that. I want what I need, and I'm out of here. But there are also those who've just not found a spiritual home at all. They're not in church. They don't understand that this is the family of God. And the reason they're not in church is because, oh, for goodness sake, you know, that church is less than perfect. Well, listen, sunshine, I bet your family is even worse. It's amazing to me how some people criticize the church, the church, but your own physical family is a stuff up. Your kids, your parents, your grandkids, your two, everyone's a mess around you. But oh, keep quiet about that. But oh, I went to church and you know, a few people didn't greet me. Oh, get that flipping attitude sorted out. No, honestly, I'm telling you there are guys and girls with an incredible weight of gifting to release. But they're so hungry and thirsty because they're running around desert places because they haven't said to the family, I'm in. I'm in. No, it's conditional. Why? Because what you expect from your own family, you should expect from the church. Can I throw this in quickly? You know that family of yours that comes before everything else? When you stand before Jesus one day, that thing gets dismissed. You're no longer married in heaven. Your children aren't your children in heaven. We are together sons and daughters of God and co-heirs with Christ. The family of God, this thing you see right now, lasts forever. Don't hold back. How do you know? You're in a spiritual wilderness. They wander in desert wastes, finding no way to a city to dwell in. Hungry, thirsty, their soul fainted within them. Listen to verse 6. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He led them by a straight way till they reached a city to dwell in. That's what he's going to do, I believe. Even through this church, he wants to take people on a straight way to this place to become part of the family. And all I ask you is please be family. I'm not even asking you to be perfect family, I'm just asking you to be family to those around you. None of us have not been hurt, criticized, judged for what we do. And the more visible you are, the more public it becomes. But it's okay, because we're all still part of a family. That's the first kind of trouble people need to be delivered out of from the scripture right there. Second one, verse 10, some set in darkness and in the shadow of death, prisoners in affliction and irons, for they had rebelled against the words of God and spurned the counsel of the Most High. So he bent them down to hard labor. Second category, I believe, are those who are in disobedience and rebellion because they have a word from the Lord about what he wants them to do and they refuse to do it. The problem is that the gift and the call of God is without repentance. Some days when church life gets hard and people criticize and everyone's got a far better idea of what I should be doing than I do, then I think to myself, what if I go work for someone? Bring my personality with. Put me in something where I think I could be useful. The problem is I would spend the rest of my days knowing I'm going to stand before a God who's only interested in what he told me to do. Not in what I did or didn't do. Elijah hiding in a cave. God's got to get him out of there. I didn't call you to the cave. I called you there. Stand up and speak. Huh? Daniel on the lines then. Doesn't matter if you're put there by the enemy. I want you out. I'll shut their mouths because you've got a job to do. You back out. God will back you when you're doing what he wants you to do. Look at verse 13. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. For some of you, it's this thing of I can't give into family. I just can't. To others, even this morning, there's those who are saying, I know the word of the Lord. Maybe it's not something I must do. Maybe it's something I must obey. Something I've got to cut off. Something I've got to deal with. And I just don't want to. It says, well, then your heart is going to labor until you cry out to the Lord in your distress. Number three, almost done. Verse 17, some were fools through their sinful ways. And because of their iniquities, suffered affliction. They loathed any kind of food. And they drew near to the gates of death. 
Now that happens too often. You see, when you live in sin, and we all have moments where you sin, isn't it? Look at some of you. Huh? Don't know what you're talking about. Anyone who hasn't sinned the last week, I'm just curious. Anyone? So we can just hit you right now, the sin of deception. Anyone? I have. I sinned last week. I got angry over something and I chose to stay that way. The Bible says, don't let the sun go, sun go down in your anger. I think I lasted two and a half days. Ooh, who was that? <laughs> <laughs> hey, who was that? Flipping heathen. <laughs> and you know what it says when you, when you, when you, when you sin? They loathe any kind of food. Jesus said, my food is to do the will of him who sent me. I don't want to do his will. I know what I should do and I don't. I loathe the food. I don't want to read my Bible because I've got to go make right. I wonder how many of us got a tree in the garden. A little besetting sin that if God were to reveal that right now through a prophet, call you out by name and say, this is what the Lord says you've been up to. Psh! I'm going to die where you sit. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He sent out his word, and he healed them. He delivered them from their destruction. God is so kind as to speak to us before we cross the line that leads to destruction. Lastly, verse 23, some went down to the sea in ships, Doing business on the great waters, they saw the deeds of the Lord, His wondrous works in the deep. For He commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted to heaven, they went down to the depths. Their courage melted away, they reeled, they staggered like drunken men. They were at their wits' end. Those who have totally devoted themselves to the pursuit of money instead of the will of the Lord. Those who are supposed to be in business, but they've allowed the pursuit of wealth instead of the pursuit of the kingdom. To define them. How do you know them? They have high highs and they have low lows. In other words, no stability, no straight road to go on. Life is a series of total ups and downs. Why? Because I'm not consistently looking at the Lord. I'm looking at what works for me. And what does he say right there? Then they cried to the Lord. In their trouble and he delivered them from their distress and Psalm 107 ends with these amazing words verse 43 whoever is wise let him attend to these things let them consider the steadfast love of the Lord this morning in this room there's no judgment there is no pointing of the finger but I think we need to consider this morning the steadfast love of the Lord. I'm not even sure what areas we might be struggling in. But if the Lord would get me to change my preach this morning, and my other preach was diligently prepared, they already have it at the back, my song's ready, all ready to rumble. When the Lord changes it this morning out of my devotions and just stuff I've been working through and tells me to put this thing together, I think he wants to deliver people out of their distress this morning. And you see, Jesus says there at the end of John chapter 2, he says, and he wouldn't entrust himself to them because he knew what's in a man. But we also know that later on, his spirit, his commandments, and his will, he did give to his disciples. Because he says this, I no longer call you servants, I call you brothers. So there was a transition. And he said, I, I share myself with you. And we're in church today. And, and, the, and the reason that God wants church to exist is to reach both to glorify God and to reach those who are not yet here. Right? And so he calls us in and he says, I call you brothers. But there are moments, I think, in church life where God says, I just want to deal with your heart. Because you see, as I said, you and I 
Because we're different to the Lord, we assess things and we make decisions and we say things on God's behalf, but we're not sure he's actually saying those things because we don't know. But he knows our hearts better than we know our own hearts because our heart is deceitful above all things. As much as the woman's deceived in the garden, we are often deceived by our own hearts, feeling things are going just great within us, not knowing where things are going to turn out. And just every now and then, I think we need these moments in God where God stops us and says, hang on. I want to talk to you about perhaps one of those four areas. How are you doing in terms of church community? How are you doing with disobedience and rebellion to words I've spoken to you? How are you doing with sin? How are you doing in the marketplace? Where's your heart? And in all those situations, all it says is, they called upon the Lord and He ministered to them in their distress. Because that's our boast. We have a God who acts Isaiah 64 verse 4, he acts for those who wait upon him. 